My name is Jessie Zebart. I'm the cultural programs manager at the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. And I would first like to acknowledge that we are coming to you from the indigenous ancestral land of the Coast Salish, Macaw, Sklalem, and Squamish peoples past and present and honor with gratitude the land and the waterways and the First Nations who have honored and protected them for thousands of years. Untold Stories is a dynamic series of free online lectures, panels, and conversations which inspire, empower, and educate through the art of storytelling. For information on this series, we have a couple of more um, untold stories coming up between now and February 3rd. You'll want to visit our website, which is www.biartmuseum.org. I'm going to open up by welcoming our panelists. It is an honor to have you with us here this evening, and Colleen will soon be joining us. Um, I want to remind everyone here today too, it goes without saying, but to please be respectful and compassionate when submitting your comments and questions. There's some sensitive conversations we're going to be having and so that'll be appreciated. We will hold a Q&A and provide instructions on how to submit your questions at the end. So please hold your questions and comments. With us this evening is Gina Corpas. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Gina. Gina is the daughter of Anacleto Corpus from the Philippines and Evelyn Williams, a Squamish Nation member from British Columbia, Canada. Her father was one of the founders of the Filipino American community of Bainbridge Island. She currently serves on the executive board for the Indipino community of Bainbridge Island and vicinity. Anna Hansen, welcome and thank you for joining us, Anna. Yahathawet Anna Hansen is a member of the Shishal Nation and Ilocano. I hope I said that correctly. I didn't ask you. you. Did good. Thank you. She is a grandmother who has worked throughout the US, Canada, and other parts of the world helping families, communities, and agencies better understand the impact of historical trauma on health and wellness, the need for creating trauma-wise workplaces, and growing cultural humility. Yata Hilwet has an MA in psychology and post MA specialization training for certification in, this is a mouthful, existential analysis and logotherapy. You'll have to explain what that is later. Okay. <laughs> Colleen Almojuela, welcome and thank you for joining us. The daughter of Thomas Corpas Almojuela and Dorothy Nahani Almojuela. Colleen grew up on Bainbridge Island. Her father was from the Philippines and her mother was a First Nations woman from Canada challenged by many conflicting socioeconomic, ethnic, and racial identity issues while living on the island, Colleen made it her life's work trying to understand the reasons and causes of her challenges in order to shape a worldview of acceptance and inclusion. She has a master's degree from Pacific Oaks College. And Andrew D. Pascua, welcome and thank you for joining us. Andrew is a 1971 graduate of Bainbridge High School who earned a degree in human services with a minor in education at Seattle University and chaired the governor's Indian Policy Advisory Committee and Ethnic Minority Mental Health Advisory Committee, the Western Washington Indian Education Consortium, and was vice president of the National Indian Child Welfare Association. He retired as a DSHS administrator in 2013 and resides with his wife Maria in Mia Bay, Washington. And Lucy Ostrander is our filmmaker here this evening. She's an independent documentary filmmaker based on Bainbridge Island and will go into detail about herself and the film here in just a moment. So welcome everyone. Welcome friends for joining us. And Lucy, why don't you go ahead and kick things off and tell us a little bit about the film and yourself. Okay, well, at first I wrote something out. So I hope you don't mind if I'm gonna be reading this, but I, first of all, I'd like to thank Bima and Jesse and Sheila Hughes for inviting me to participate in tonight's Untold Stories. I'm also honored to be asked to provide some background of, um, of the film um, and, and a brief overview. I think Untold Stories is the perfect title for the stories you'll be hearing tonight. They are stories that were too painful to share with others, even those within the Indipino community. They are now coming to light with the making of our documentary film, Honor Thy Mother. I was asked to participate in this panel as I've been working closely with members of the Indipino community on a film they wanted produced about their untold stories of growing up on Bainbridge, as well as the untold stories of their indigenous mothers who migrated to Bainbridge starting in the spring of 1942 to pick berries. They had been recruited by Filipino immigrants 
who worked for the Japanese American strawberry farmers who were in need of additional help after the Bainbridge Island Japanese American community had been forcibly removed from the island on March 30th, 1942 and sent to the Manzanar concentration camp. While some of the women who had been recruited came from several different tribes in Washington, many of their mothers migrated to Bainbridge from British Columbia. In doing the research for this film, it was discovered there were 36 Aboriginal and Native American women from 19 different tribes. For those young women who migrated to Bainbridge from British Columbia, many of them had been forced to attend the Canadian Indian residential schools where they had been taken from their families at the age of five and where they were not allowed to speak their native languages or practice their cultural traditions. Upon arriving on Bainbridge, many of the young women and Filipino bachelors fell in love amongst the strawberry fields, married and started families. As the children from these marriages started to reach adulthood and were seeking an identity for themselves, they started to call themselves Indipinos. Tonight, you'll hear from some of them. Before Gina Corpus, Anna Rinonas Hansen, Colleen Amuela, and Andrew Pasqua start, I want to mention that in addition to interviewing these four panelists for the film, we also interviewed two other members of the Indipino community, Tina Salanga Colson and Sunny Dulay, as well as a British Columbia Squamish elder, Gwen Harry, who attended the St. Michael's Residential School on Vancouver Island. You'll hear their stories in our documentary, which we hope to complete sometime this spring. The pandemic has slowed our timetable a bit. We'll then start submitting it to film festivals and eventually plan a special screening on Bainbridge. I'd also like to mention that this film has been made possible because of the tremendous financial support we have received from the Bainbridge Island community, including the Bainbridge Community Fund, Bainbridge Town and Country Market, Bainbridge Ace Hardware, and the Bainbridge Island Japanese American community. So that's it. Thank you, Lucy. And thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate it. Um, Gina and Lucy, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you know each other and how this project came about? I first met Gina when I produced a film for Islandwood called um, Island Roots about the Filipino American community. And um, Gina was in that film and that's how we met. And, and then, I don't know, Gina, do you wanna tell how, how this whole project started? Well, it, it actually started with Indigenous Peoples Day and we've been celebrating uh, Indigenous Peoples Day for four years now. Um, and I had invited Anna and Andy and Colleen to serve on a panel. And I called Lucy and asked her if she and Don could uh, record the panel discussion. And it grew from there into this fabulous film that uh, I'm really proud to say is really coming along nicely. It's very powerful. And you've had a lot of support along the way, correct? I mean, it's it's my understanding that you were able to secure an awesome grant, and you know, you've had some support from the community as well to get this made to tell the story. Absolutely, um, we received the largest grant ever awarded by the Bainbridge Community Foundation, and it uh, put us over the top for our fundraising goal. And it, it's really just fabulous because now we can just really concentrate on the making of the film. I just want to say that um, we put together that we we shot these oral histories back in September of 2019 and put together a 15 minute promo, just clips from these interviews. And um, that was shown to the Bainbridge Community Fund. And I, I think that, that, um, that they were so moved by what they heard from these interviews that they made this, as Gina said, the largest grant that they have ever made. Which is absolutely incredible. And thanks for going after it because now we get to hear some of the stories this evening. Um, I'd like to go ahead and just open this up a little bit to everyone to answer a couple questions. Um, why don't we just start with each of you telling us 
about your families and growing up on Bainbridge Island, just what was life like and, and what were your families like when you were, when you were little? Anna, let's start with you. Um, I've already forgotten your question. <laughs> Sorry. Well, let's, let's just talk a little bit about, about your families and, and what life was like on Bainbridge, you know, growing up in the forties and fifties. Ah, uh, um, well, I'm the daughter of uh, Grace Augustine, who's seashell, and uh, Ben Carcion Renonis from uh, Bagnoten La Union in the Philippines. Uh, I'm the oldest of six, and um, I'm growing up on the island, uh, my it, it it uh, it was hard for me to kind of try to figure out just a few little things that that had happened in terms of the difference between um, experiences at home and experiences uh, within in the school system. Um, overall, I think in the family life in the community life, there were uh, so many good good memories and. Um, some hard memories also, because in that time I lost my mother when I was in the seventh grade. So that profoundly changed um, my life. Um, when I first thought of this, uh, your question, um, this area in Island Center where I grew up is the same area where my husband grew up. And um, one of the things that I heard uh, was this island, there, this area on the island was called Brown Alley because there's so many uh, Filipino Indian families in surrounding this area. And I, I just didn't know that it had been one of the things that uh, was um, said about this area. And um, I went to throughout the, the whole school system on the island. I belong to the Catholic church. I was a, a bluebird and a campfire girl and joined a lot of uh, activities. And um, I, I think the changes started to happen. Um, maybe not changes is correct. Uh, to get messages in within the school system um, of difference and something wrong or not okay uh, about me. And the earliest one that came to mind, and it's a very short story, um, was um, in first grade, I uh, was sharing my lunch with my cousin Jerry because he hadn't brought his lunch. And um, the teacher told me um, that I wasn't supposed to do that. And at home, I'd been taught to share and he's my, in, my cousin, so I, I needed to do that. And she said, no, you only, uh, you eat your own lunch and he has to bring his. And I, I said, he didn't bring his and he's be hungry. And so she said, no. And so we couldn't go out to recess because I had shared my lunch. And so I, the next time that he forgot his lunch, I snuck a sandwich over to him and she did find out and she hit our hands with a ruler and she's, we had, because we had disobeyed. And um, that was really, really harsh and hard. And so I, I went home and told my dad first, I wasn't sure if I should tell my mom and when I told my mother, um, she told me the exact opposite of what I was been raised on. Well, in school, you don't share. And so <laughs> my cousin always forgot his lunch. So I always shared my lunch. And so it was a, as a little kid, it was sort of a double whammy on how to deal with that because I was still sneaking to give him an apple or part of my sandwich and so that's a small story, but there's hundreds of them 
that come in that um, format. And so some of that time for me was uh, quite confusing in terms of, of you know, what were the right things to do or because the messaging was so strong and in such a different way. Um, but so I graduated. <laughs> so I guess maybe the question for the group should be, what were you taught about your family as a child? What was your understanding of your family and your identity as a child growing up on Bainbridge? Jump on in there, anyone. I was, uh, I have to agree with Anna. There were some really hard times and uh, confusing and sometimes really painful because we were called the brown kids and because we uh, really had no self-concept of who we were as a people, um, we didn't question it. So we just knew ourselves as the brown kids. And in the process of my identity formation, it definitely was not linear. It was um, really bumpy. It was a bumpy, a lot of zigzags in and out because we were not just forming who we were as bicultural people or biracial people, but we were in fact bicultural people trying to acculturate ourselves into American culture, into mainstream society and because we didn't have a really uh, strong self-concept of who we were as a people, um, some of us did fine and others of us did not. And because of the times, because it was during the 40s and the 50s, of course the 40s right um, during World War II and the Japanese American evacuation and our fathers immigrated from the Philippines and they're Asians as well. So I was really raised with a lot of fear about who was gonna go next. And also my mother and my father, English was not their first language. So we didn't have the same conversations at home that we had in school because my father had a really hard time carrying on a conversation with us. So most of our uh, communication was, he communicated with us in demands because that's what he knew. Get up, go to bed, go to school. And so sometimes, and he had to raise six girls. And so that's why a lot of people say now, that's why you girls are so bossy. <laughs> <laughs> we grew up with commands, so we think we're supposed to command everybody to do that. Um, but that was our reality. And, and the other part of that is my father, he had a high school education, but most of the Filipino immigrants only went to the eighth grade. In fact, Anna's father was my dad's school teacher in the Philippines, hmm. and we ended up being neighbors. And my mother, of course, was released from boarding school when she was 50. And so they had a really limited education, but they were both land-based people. My mother's traditional territory was in BC. My father was a rice farmer in the Philippines and we had a 20 acre farm on Bainbridge, but you don't get rich growing berries. And so we were so, so poor. And I, I think that there was equally as much um, shame around being poor as being brown. So, it, you know, that intersection of being different because you're a person of color, but you're also poor is um, really kind of hard to deal with. Um, and, and so it was, and also, Oftentimes in biracial families, one race dominates the other. Uh, definitely the Filipino um, 
culture was dominant over the indigenous culture. I was raised by my father to believe that I was Asian. Never ever spoken to about being an indigenous person. And it wasn't until I was really an adult that I started to really be aware of my mother and who she was and who my relatives are. So um, I started to construct my own identity. And I think that's, that's why I really accepted um, who I am and yeah. I have a lot of pride in it. Yeah. And, and part of that is, is that's why I um, got my master's in education is because I just really saw how my educational history was lacking K to 12. Andy, do you have, what are, what are your thoughts on that? How did what you were taught in school as a kid and at home as a kid affect, you know, your own cultural identity and, and growing up and how you, what you thought about yourself? Well, my dad came from, um, Narvacon and Locusor in the Philippines and Luzon Island um, came over to look for a better life. And my mom comes from Coquitlam, um, BC, the Coquitlam um, band. And her family is also from Coquitlam and Nanaimo. And she went through boarding school. Um, and when she finished, she came right down, right on down, right from school, right on down to the strawberry fields. And um, because of their, their lifestyle, they, they, they were basically brainwashed in the, in the, in the boarding schools. And um, her life was, she learned how to work in the kitchen and culinary work. And putting that together, that was, her skills, and because her came home during a during a or in school during the summers, go home for a few weeks. By doing that, they they had meals for people coming over, investors coming over from from Europe, and um, my mom was part of the kitchen crew that that. Uh, Put on a good meal for them and if you were in the band then you had to stay and play music and that was they were showing off what they did with the little savage kids look that we've aimed them to do this and so mm -hmm. they didn't get to go home during the summers so when my mom finished boarding school she came down to bainbridge and and um quickly looked for love and 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 married right away i mean she was 17 years old and so when you look at that she didn't have the opportunity to visualize and experience what home life was like so here's these young kids um, marrying in a new country and that's the way they started without any upbringing on what it was like to be in a family situation with a mother, a father, and grandparents. So that was the beginning. So when I got old enough to go to school, my mom was, you know, she just thought of what her schooling was. And it was, you have to do what the teachers say and don't don't argue be polite culturally we were taught not to look people in the eyes so we always as a student we were always with our, our head looking down and the teachers thought that that was disrespectful and i have remembered te teachers coming and grabbing my chin and lifting my chin up so I could look them in the face and they'd say, look at me. You know, I'm telling you something. And so it was very confusing, confusing cultural wise. You know, at home you are told this and 
you go into the school so you're being told something else and physically being forced to do different things that was not natural to your culture so as a child growing up i was very confused um and then the conflict between our two cultures for our parents. Um, there again, the Filipino culture was, was dominant. So whatever dad wanted or said, that was the way it was. And mom growing up in the boarding school, she just went along with everything. Just, yes, okay, this is what we're doing. You know, dad said this and so, you know, we're gonna make it happen. Well, I grew up and we had, we were one of the smaller farmers. We only had uh, 10 acres of, of berries. And my dad worked as a gardener when, when it wasn't berry season. And then later on, and as I was growing up, they ended up going up to work in the fish canneries in Alaska. And that was the way we survived. But um, during the low tides, no matter if it was one or two o'clock in the morning, we would be down at the beach digging clams and gathering shellfish. Um, that's the way life was. We, we had to do what, what we needed to have food on the table. And when I graduated from high school, and applied for college, they asked me to fill out the student aid paperwork. And I was shocked because they said, yes, you, you come from a poverty level family. And, you know, when we were taught, we had food on a table, we had a roof over our head, we had clothes on our back. We went to church every Sunday. We weren't a poor, impoverished family. We got along. I mean, in school, we heard about the third world nations and children not getting to eat and their belly buttons pooched out because they were malnutrition. And to me, that was poor. So I was offended when, you know, I was applying for financial aid for school, for college, because I had no clue that I was poor and grew up in a poor family. Mm -hmm. Colleen, we haven't heard from you yet. No, and I apologize. Hi. Hi. <laughs> We're taking turns. It's your turn. Yes. I apologize for being late. I was having a, I know some of my students are online and they're probably laughing because I always, I always have technical problems. But <laughs> anyway, I'm here now. Join the and club. <laughs> And um, I am the daughter of Margaret Lackage. I'm the granddaughter of Margaret Lackage and Edward Mahaney. I am the daughter of Thomas Corpus Almoela and Dorothy Mahaney Almoela. I have two sons, Anthony and Justin, and one grandson whose name is Dylan. Um, my name is Colleen Almoela. I am a member of the Squamish Nation. Um, my reserve is in North Vancouver, and uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am, I'm, I'm listening to the other stories and seeing one of the things about this project has done, it has, you know, we are, we're all identified as Indipinas, Indipinos. And, but our stories are very, you know, our stories are different, not very different, but our stories are different. For instance, Anna talked about Brown, Brown Alley 
And my perception of Brown Alley was I wished I'd lived down that area because that's where all the kids were. Um, but I grew up on before highway, highway, uh, the highway went through Bainbridge Island. And we have a we have a joke, those of us who grew up in that area that that we lived before the highway. And so, um, but there were at least four, four Filipino fathers who had um, had large strawberry farms in the area where I grew up. Uh, there was my uncle, Garcia Elmuela. There was uh, uncle, uncle Pete Corpus was also uncle Vic, uh, Vico and, and Carl and some other men and um, the Amazons, the, Fil the Felix Amazons. But we were um, kind of in a little neighborhood. And so that's who we associated with. There were, um, and so I guess we would say that we were the, um, before the highway gang, um, we were pretty isolated out there and we didn't really go out very much uh, until we went to school. So our whole existence was about, you know, about our community. And so the only time we would ever go to other places on Bainbridge was when we got to go to the grocery store. And so, you know, and that was our exposure to the outside world until we went to public school. So what I remember, it was pretty happy, except for the times when we had, you know, to work in the fields and things like that. I mean, we, I think we all hated um, picking strawberries and weeding strawberries and doing all of that. But we had to do that from the time we could, you know, as soon as we could uh, pick a flat of berries probably. So, oh, you know, we, uh, we would do that. And so, but I remember when I first went to school, um, when I first, the first day of school in kindergarten is I remember what it was like. I remember the reality of, I am different in this environment, you know, because uh, all of the other, uh, all of the other students were white, the teacher was white and how they interacted with each other was much different than it was, you know, for me in my home. I, it was very noisy. I guess that that's one thing I do remember because um, usually when we were in a setting with adults, we were quiet, you know, that's, that's what, as culturally speaking, we were allowed to be in the room with our adults, but we sat and we listened. And that most of my cultural learning came from, um, you know, age one through five, just sitting in the kitchen, listening to my great grandmother and my aunties and my cousins, you know, just absorbing everything that they were talking about, whether it was stuff I should know about or not, is I was allowed to sit there. And, you know, my, and I, I grew up with brothers and most, and so, you know, that my brothers were out playing and so, but I found it, you know, I, I really appreciate the fact, even as a, as a, um, before going to school, just sitting and listening to stories. Um, but I don't think we, you know, we didn't hear stories about, I didn't hear stories about residential school. I didn't hear those stories. Um, there was a lot of laughter. Uh, I do remember that, but it wasn't until I got older that I understood that my mother was a day student. She didn't have to go to residential school and stay at the boarding school because she was taking care of my mother who was um, just recently, I think they realized that she was suffering from 
ALS, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. Mm. Uh, before that, they thought she had maybe Hodgkin's disease or whatever. But she was, um, she was an invalid um, and she wasn't even able to feed herself. And um, so my mother was the one who took care of her. I mean, you know, that was before the days of food processors, my mom would chew her food and then give it to my grandmother. So literally she kept my mother, my grandmother alive for mm -hmm. at least seven years. And then she finally decided that she wanted, um, and so her, that she wanted to, a break. So that's when she came down to Bainbridge. Um, my extended family had been coming down for, for several years since the 30s and this was in the 40s. And so, um, and one of the reason later on, I found out from conversations with her, the reason she came down was not, um, was she was getting into alcohol you know, alcoholism and partying and, and all those other things that, you know, happens when you're in your teens and early 20s. And she knew she didn't want to raise a family. And so she knew that she, she wanted to get away from it. And so since my extended family had been coming down to Bainbridge, since the 30s, she decided to hop on a, you know, I, I still can't figure out how they got to Bainbridge uh, because I know it wasn't by bus, but I think they, they used to come down by train. Um, there's a whole story about what happened that, when they got to Seattle, but I don't think I'll tell that story. Anyway, they got, so they got on the, on the ferry, got to Bainbridge, and when they got to Bainbridge, there were several trucks, large trucks with Japanese and Filipino farmers. And so my mom tells the story and I think anyone who comes, came in contact with my mom in her later years heard the story about, she saw my dad, fell in love and the rest is history. Um, so they married that summer and that was in 1942. But I think Mom and dad really, one of the things I know about my dad is he was a strong believer in being American. He wanted us to be American. So I can remember when we, um, when we had Tagalog classes at Bainbridge High School and I was, I would go home and I'd try to speak, speak to him in Tagalog and he'd get really angry. He'd say, why, why are you talking like that? He'd say, you're an American. And then because perhaps it's because of what happened in residential school and the fact that when my mother came down and married my father, she lost her First Nation status because of the Indian Act. So she could never, she could no longer call herself Squamish so I don't know what impact that had. So anyway, um, you know, these, these questions, I mean, the answers to these questions are so complex, you know, and I talked about this earlier with the panel, it just causes you to go down this rabbit hole. And because one story leads to another story um, and each story is, uh, is painful once you realize the what's beneath the story, what's you know um, the anger and the pain that you felt when you realized that when somebody asks you what are you, you can't answer the question because as an adult I was asked that when I lived in North Carolina, what are you? because it had to be on your driver's license. And um, I didn't know what race Native Americans were. I didn't know what race Filipinos were. So he looked at my uh, first husband who was white and he said, well, 
I know you're not, and this is just using terminology of the time. I know you're not Negro, so you must be white. So my driver's license said that I was white. And so that was the, that was the train wreck, if you will. I wanted to know why, why couldn't I say what I was? And so thank goodness I moved back to Bainbridge. And then that's when my whole identity development began was on Bainbridge. I had to go home and find out why, so. Thank you. So um, I grew up on Bainbridge also in the 80s and the 90s, and I had never heard the word Indipino until I was well into adulthood. And so that history was most definitely left out of everything that I learned growing up on Bainbridge Island. Um, why was it left out? We're oftentimes left out. Uh, we're most times the last to be called to the table. Uh, I remember why when that? I was, pardon? Why, why? Like, why is that? Yeah. Why, um, well, partly it's self-inflicted uh, and part of it's totally legislated acts of discrimination that when you are a persecuted person, you tend to want to go invisible because you don't want to be a victim. You don't want to be targeted. You don't want to be conspicuous. I remember when I was 15 years old, I think my whole life I've questioned uh, my identity. And I wrote a poem when I was 15 years old and I don't know why, but I sent it to the editor of the Bainbridge Review and he printed it. And then he asked me to actually write an editorial every week about my experience. So you see what I mean? Our, our development, our identity formation is not linear. Sometimes people embrace us and sometimes they don't. It just depends on the time. So I was clearly embraced by the uh, newspaper owner and he hired me to write an editorial every week about racism on Bainbridge. And he paid me 15 cents a line. I thought that was a lot of money. I think I only wrote for three weeks because the letters started pouring into the Bainbridge Review. We're going to cancel our subscription. Racism doesn't exist on Bainbridge. Uh, she has a persecution complex. She has a chip on her shoulder. And these are all classic responses about racism because race is a really hard topic to talk about. And um, people say, well, you shouldn't take it personally, but guess what? It is personal. Your identity is very personal, <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, so I was 15 years old mm -hmm. and that was over 50 years ago and I'm still doing the work. Right. Still so doing the work to reduce prejudice. And I think everybody on this panel, our work for the last 50 years has been prejudice reduction. And we know that racism is perennial. It comes back every year, but we keep doing the work. Thank God you do. Thank you. And it's exhausting work because of just the complexity of it all. And that it, you ask the why in terms of why is our history not included? And just historically, history is, is told from uh, a particular perspective um, or a worldview um, that, that doesn't include indigenous people. Mm -hmm. I mean, even today, if you even get on a ferry and you move around the island and you go down to Winslow or, I mean, there aren't, there aren't, um, 
images, stories of Suquamish or the other communities that that live and thrive here on the island. So it's the um, invisibility of of the Filipino Indian community that that still exists. And so the complication of, of, of speaking about identity um, includes the experience of growing up here because it really is your family and your community who help build your identity because each of us have to come up with um, answers to who am I? There's three, three developmental things we, we have to grow into as human beings and answer the questions around who am I? Uh, what do I have to offer? Uh, and where do I belong? And so many of the messages for the who am I was not enough. You're not enough. You're not a, a human or you're too different. Uh, and they're done and it's done, experienced and done in s very small ways. Uh, that include the, the story I shared or even sharing about the food that I ate or the summer vacation that we'd have to get up and talk. And um, my summer vacation was helping out in the fields and I we didn't go on big trips. And so, so it was hard to know how to talk about the difference or to um, have any words that have to do with it. Uh, the the who am I part in in order to not feel less than or experience being less than or not enough and the um, what do I have to offer I mean, with messages of, of not being smart enough my father always be always told me I was very smart and in the um, growing up I, I felt not smart because of um, feedback from teachers or um, other adults that didn't understand what I was e either trying to say or trying to explain. Mm -hmm. And um, so the what do I have to offer uh, was often um, confusing. And I did talk to my dad about it one time and um, I, I was upset by how a teacher had treated me and, and that the teacher was saying that I, I was not very, that I wasn't smart was the message that I was receiving. And, and um, my dad said, do you not know you are, you are smart? He said, you know, you're smart, right? And I said, yeah, I think I am. And he, he said, do you, you know, some people no can see they can't see you. You're invisible. And um, he said, you have to believe and know you are smart. You are so or you're more confident than you. not so smart if you don't know that. And you know, I was like, <laughs> my father spoke like that. So sometimes it was a little more confusing until I grew up. And the last part of around where do I belong was hard because like Gina's saying and and what we've talked about as a panel is my mother had run away from uh, residential school in Canada and hid in the United States and um, survived down here as a 14 15 year old so that I think that's very amazing and and then when she was taken off the rolls because she um, was um, with a non-native person, the, Canada took her off the rolls. And part of the thing that she said to me often was, I don't know who I am. I'm not Indian anymore. So you're not Indian. I mean, she directly said you're Filipino. And um, today as a grown woman, I, I cannot imagine that struggle inside of her to be told by the a government yes. that you are no longer are who you are and so her confusion 
impacted me and where some of the where do I belong um, grew was when my aunties and my grannies, like um, Colleen is saying, when they'd come and they'd visit and spend time and would tell us stories. I mean, that's how I got to know some of what Indian or sea shelf was. And it, so it came in increments of, of the who am I and where do I belong and what do I have to offer? But it, it's, it's like Gina saying, not a linear process. It, it's, it's like this as you are continually countering the flood of uh, messaging and treatment of, mm -hmm. of being wrong or mm -hmm. not the not enough. And um, so it's, it's still ongoing. Um, you know, I'm a grown woman, I, I have grandchildren um, and I, I see how much uh, needs to happen in terms of positive change and health and wellness for uh, indigenous people. And when I say indigenous, I include my, my father's people because they're indigenous to the area they came from as Ilocano people. Sorry, I just jumped in there with all yeah. this energy. So in terms of, yeah, Colleen, go ahead. Oh. Did you have a question? I thought, thought no, I, I have a just a comment about you know how um, as you know as a kindergarten as a kindergarten student, I'm realizing that I was different, and I figured out at that very young age that in order to be accepted in this environment, I had to learn what my difference was and a and adapt how my, my fellow students were, how they interacted with each other. I watched, I was very observant of the students around me to the point of, uh, to the point of just totally assimilating. And I use that word very, you know, it's, it's not acculturation, it's assimilation you know, so that I wouldn't be different. I wouldn't be seen as different, you know, because, uh, you know, my brother and I, we experienced, you know, those direct uh, racist uh, comments and interactions and uh, that hurt really bad. And so the best thing would be to try to assimilate and become a part of the fabric of what the school was. And so, you know, when I came back um, and moved back to the island, and I remember I started working for the school district almost immediately <clears throat> as a minority liaison. Don't remember what the label was then. And when one of the school secretaries, she just said, why are, you know, and I was very active. I be had, had become very active. Um, in, in like cultural identity. And at that time it was like, you know, just trying to figure out who we were as uh, Filipino and indigenous people. And being very, when you first go into it, you, there's an anger about it. You carry an anger you keep, because you don't, you have the feeling you don't know what to do with it. So, you know, you, I think you go through different stages and anger is one of them. And I remember that this high school secretary, she, she said, why are you doing that? I said, what? She said, your family was very successful. You made it through Bainbridge. You know, you all did really well. So now we're, why are you creating these problems? You know, and so it was like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and so it was like, Oh my goodness, you know, and so, you know, the journey began, the journey sure. had begun and it just, it, it leads me to where I am today, but it's also brings back a story. I just, um, I brought out my master's thesis because my master's thesis was all about this. It was a climate of harmony and hostility was my thesis, but 
I, I was reading a story about there was in 1971, there was the first Far West Filipino conference in Seattle. And I remember going with a group and one of the high school students who went with us in looked at me and said, what is she doing here? So, you know, I was getting that. You know, and yeah. I, I had to prove myself, not only, I had to prove myself to my own community. So the challenge yeah. isn't, you know, the, I still get emotional. <laughs> yeah, I still get emotional. The feelings never go away. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Colleen. One of, um, we met earlier in the week to kind of get to know each other a little bit before we hopped on this call today. And one of you quoted Dan Barron, who said, how do you assign feelings to that which is undiscussable and indescribable? So how would you answer that question? How do you assign feelings? It is. Andrew, why don't I, why don't I go to you? Wow, it, it's really hard to say. Um, you know, in our discussions, we talked about how we, how did we it was by not being upfront, not, you were quiet and sat at the back of the room. Um, you know, you, you, you hid as much as you could. I look back and, and I think about um, an incident happened when I was in, in grade school and they had the spelling bees and I got called on to come up to the front of the room um, and I misspelled the word. And the whole class laughed at me, including the teacher. And I have to say that that one thing hurt so bad that it stayed with me my whole life. Uh, even today when I'm writing, I'm worried about misspelling and, you know, thank God for the computers and, and spell check and, uh, mm -hmm. but, that zapped me so bad that, you know, I didn't feel like I belonged. Mm -hmm. So you hid in the in in the, the background as much as you could, and you know I probably wouldn't have made it through school. I mean, there you know, Father Gobel from the church told me he said, "By all rights, you should be a delinquent." Um, and I have to say the reason why I'm not today is because of sports. Mm -hmm. And I was able to, to I was in seventh grade and, um, that we, in the mid sixties, Bainbridge had academic levels in order to play sports. I mean, that didn't come around statewide until what the mid 70s and everyone was upset about that. But Bainbridge, Bainbridge School Districts, they did that in, in the mid 60s. So um, I had to work hard to make sure that my grades were up to be able to, to stay on the team. And at that point, um, well, even at that point, I was on the team, but um, really had to work hard to stay on the team. Um, some of the coaches used to, you know, call me Indian. Hey, Indian, come over here. Um, you were, you know, and I think they thought that was a, you know, just a, a, a way of accepting me, but it's so degrading. And, mm -hmm. you know, you just, went along with it. So feelings, you, you, you put away your feelings and you did what you could do to survive. And I remember 
coming home and telling my sister, why can't we be white? I want to be white. What if you dyed my hair blonde? I mean, blonde, tan people are, are popular. Just dye my hair blonde and I could be white like the other kids. And then later, as school went on, all I could think of is, we've got to get off of this island. You know, I can't wait to graduate. I can't wait to move away from here because we don't belong. Um, we don't feel like we're part of this, even though we lived on island even though we participated in sports and did well. Um, you went down to the IGA and you'd have people following you through the aisles to see if you're gonna steal something. Um, you go down to Winslow and walk down the, through the, the shops and next thing you know, you'd see the police car pull up because one of the merchants called and said there's someone loitering down here and he's brown. Um, those things are, they're, they're real. And as an adult, as an elder, I can come back and still walk into some of the merchants and still feel that those eyes that are on me. Mm -hmm. And you might as well just put your hands up and say, look, I'm here to buy a candy bar. I'm not gonna rob you. I'm not looking for something to steal. You know, I'll be out of your store as soon as I get my candy bar. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't feel like uh, uh, walking and, and window shopping because I don't wanna be accused of stealing. Um, how do we hide it? How do we deal with it? Sometimes you just can't hide it. And to cope with what life is. And, and unfortunately, over the years, we've tried different things. We started off with the Rainbow Coalition in schools. Um, the, we have uh, uh, staff at, at the schools that are native working with our students. Um, I worked at North Kitsap's um, school district with the, in the Indian Education Department and worked um, K through 12 and tried to work with, with students at, at looking at the different issues that came up to look at the issue itself and, you know, well, did you do wrong? Yes, you know, okay, well, the consequences that come with that aren't necessarily being pointed at and being um, a prejudice act. And, but on the other hand, there were some teachers that you could really see. And um, happily, the superintendent worked with us. And on different occasions, we had a student that, that um, just went to class, but he was smart. And the senior year, um, he was failing his, his history. And the superintendent came down and said, hey, Andy, this, this student is failing. So I had to go and talk to him and his family and that he needed to complete this history class, otherwise he wouldn't graduate. So this student worked really hard and for the last couple months of, of class, he got straight A's on his, his uh, unit assignments and his final. And the teacher came and said, you know, um, he's cheating. Mm -hmm. He's cheating. There, there's no, you know, there's no, he's been getting B's the whole term and, you know, all of a sudden he's getting, getting A's, he's cheating. And the principal said, okay, Let's give him a, 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 another test. And we put his chair in the middle of the gym floor. 
and a table and administered a second test with the principal or the, the superintendent and I sitting on the bleachers and he aced that test. And there again, it's, it's kind of like we had to prove and double prove, I mean, that given an opportunity or put, being put back against the wall, some of our students can come out and, and do well because what was expected of them was that they were dumb and they couldn't do it. And when it came down to a, a, a graduate or not graduate, this student showed that he was brilliant enough to study and pass the test. So there's different stories that we've had to deal with throughout our, our careers that we're always fighting, we're always battling. When I worked for the state of Washington, I was having to, to battle legislators because they want, just didn't want to give native programs the funding. And they, there was a fight to call us uh, um, um, not tribal, not nations, but they wanted to group of, uh, us into um, um, special interest groups. And then they were turning to look at just defunding special interest groups. And if we were allowed that to happen, the fundings coming to states would have been wiped out. So trust is, is really hard, even as we grow into our elder years of what is going on and the th things that we fought for. And each one on this panel has worked hard for education, for social services, for our people. The next generation is cashing in on the hard work that we've put forward. And when we ask them some of this stuff, they, they, they don't see it the way we do. Mm -hmm. And in fact, some of my own classmates, you know, why are you fighting for this? You know, that wasn't, that wasn't a, an atrocity that my, I did or my parents did or my grandparents. Uh, why, are you, why are you fighting this issue? Because it still affects us today, even if it was legislation that was done a couple generations ago. And we look at culturally we're taught that what we do today will affect the next seven generations. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, culturally, we have so many different differences. And it's hard to say what does work or not work. But right. the best thing to do is to look at how we treat each other as people. Thank you. Thank you. Andy. And because the other side of it is what you're taught, what all of us have been touching on is the impact of trauma on our on our lives, on our parents' lives. And what we we know about historical trauma and trauma is that it does get passed on. And it it has to be said that the structure of, of racism that's in the country, that's here on the island, it, it, it does impact uh, so deeply um, because it, it's, it, when it's ongoing and continues collectively for, for the indigenous people, it's, uh, it is trauma. And that's what Dan Baron was talking about in terms of how do you assign feelings to something that is so profound and so deep. And in our elderhood, we're, we're trying to put names and, and allow our feelings um, to come forward. Um, and we've been doing that for a long time. And it, it isn't that 
we're going to arrive to a healing place um, in terms of the Holocaust for indigenous people, because the difference is, is, is the Holocaust, the story or the history of the Holocaust um, was in a certain period of time. And for indigenous people, um, it's, it, it continues. It's a, it's a, a longer period of time and, and it, it impacts us as human beings because it's uh, indescribable. Some of the things that have occurred are there isn't a way to speak. And that's why my mother didn't speak about her experience of residential school. She ran away from it. My father who left his country for a better life also experienced under the colonization and oppression of, of the Spanish people and then the war over there that he couldn't speak of. And so we carry that it, within our gene structure, also those levels of, of stress and harm at the same time experiencing, experiencing it in the day to day. And uh, I, I get followed in the stores also still today. And that causes stress. And, and when they're all back to back to back, the impact it on the body and spirit is, is great. And so we keep doing the work because we don't want our, the younger ones to go through that for the rest of their life. And it, it won't be just indigenous people who, who, who make this, uh, e even out the, of this world out of balance, as my brother Harold Belmont always said, this is a time of a world out of balance. And this is our time to, to join together and not just the indigenous people, but all of the people, the global family, on how do we treat each other, like you're saying, Andy, with some kindness and compassion and see the humanity that each of us carry and that each of us have a gift to give and that each of us belong here because we were placed here by the creator. These are old teachings. And the who am I, the messaging of of your being a, a good human being. It was always a, a compliment when uh, you hear from the elders at home and they say, oh, she's, she's, that's a good man. That was the highest compliment because they were living as a, as a, a good human being with other human beings. And Jesse, when you were talking about honoring the land and the, the people who lived on the lands, this other part of the teaching that has to do with knowing the land that you're going through is um, like I've been taught and traveled in different parts of the, the world to know that I'm entering indigenous territory and I go in and I introduce myself on that land, not to the people, to the spirits that are there and to the land itself. And I, in the honoring of that land, I'm also saying I, I will come in a good way and not harm the people or the land. Yeah. That's, that's what that means when I'm saying I'm on Suquamish territory, that I, I'm going to walk in on it in a good way as a seashell woman, as you tahle with, because that's the honoring and the respect. These teachings are, 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 are so helpful. <laughs> I don't know why it becomes a threat to, to the United States or Canada or in Australia who the Aboriginal people are going through the same thing. And trying to put words, descriptive feeling words to the truth of a history that is quite um, grand and huge of um, pain due to Holocaust is what we're all in the middle of right now. And that causes great discomfort to non-native, non-Filipino people because it, it's, hard to, it's hard to face it. And so we're in that time where we got to tell our stories and we've got to, uh, to say our truths and start knowing how uncomfortable we feel on the inside so that we, we can identify the feelings like anger, sadness. There is great grief that has occurred 
so much loss that has occurred. So the sadness comes, comes with it because I'm a human being, each one of us are. And the ongoing need for the human family to respond in that way of just willingness to listen in, in a compassionate and kind way without the instruction to tell you to, that you need to tell your story in a different way. Like mm -hmm. has been said to a number of the panel uh, members, you, you did good, you know, why are you bringing it up? And, and it, it isn't complaining, mm -hmm. it's naming what has occurred that has harmed. That's a perfect segue into the question. So you've talked about, you know, Andy touched on, you know, hiding who you are. And Anna, you've touched on unspeakable things, but now you're all telling your story. And so I'll, I'll start with Lucy. What's important about memorializing this story now? That's Big question. <laughs> it, it's a story that you know, people, people in Bainbridge don't know about. It's a story that the broader community, the broader world doesn't know about. And um, these are, as you've just heard, these are really powerful stories that um, people should know about. So. Colleen, what's, what's important on the, for you? On the freeway too. <laughs> Oh, sorry, Andy, I think something's picking, there's some sound picking up in your room. Colleen, I wanted to see if you wanted to comment on that. What's, what are, what are your hopes for this documentary? What are you hoping this, you know, it's, you, you, you all have mentioned that this could be used as an educational tool and, and like, what are, what are your hopes for the outcome of this film? That's an interesting uh, question. Cause I've been thinking about that. I mean, during this is we've been telling our stories for such a long time. When are people going to hear it? And I think that you know the the film is going to do that. The keep because people will have the the ability to have a resource to go to. You know, I even you know there like I said earlier, there's so many stories. There's so many stories of of pain and hurt and anger that each one of us hold mm -hmm. uh, but if you know and you know to be able to to respect um to be able to to tell my mom and dad's story and you know just to give them the respect that they deserve for what they've created, um, who they've created, you know, is just one of the um, legacy, if you will, that mm -hmm. the film uh, leaves for me is mm -hmm. it honors who they were, my parents, my relations. Uh, so I guess I'm, you know, one of the things that happens every time we, I have this kind of conversation is I get tired, you know, because yeah. the emotion has been so, uh, you know, people who know me, I think can see when I feel, when, when I'm angry or when I'm in pain, but other people I'm so, you know, even you can't see it or you can't feel it, but inside me it just is just turmoil and um you know yet um i'm gonna pass it on otherwise i'm gonna go down a rabbit hole i, I just want to add one thing that in making this film i i didn't know anything about the canadian indian residential schools and that was a big eye opener for me and that's you will hear that in this film um not only from the panelists tonight, but um, from Gwen Harry, who um, attended um, one of these Indian residential schools. And um, it's, uh, I mean, the Canadian uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2015 said that 
the Indian residential schools were a form of cultural genocide. And um, very true. I, I had absolutely no knowledge of this. And I think it's also think important to acknowledge the fact that those schools existed here in the United States too. Um, and they, you know, all over, all over the world where colonization happened, residential school was part of the strategy to, to eliminate indigenous culture, to make. Um, you know, it's, it is really, it is really hard to be. And, and to add to what you're saying, Colleen, the, the United, the Canada asked the United States for help with their Indian problem because they knew that the United States had dealt with an Indian problem here. And so they shared how to put in, put, if you, what was, the, what was said it was, what we figured out is that if we took the children, we could see how important the children are. And if we take them from the family, it will break them. That's what the United States shared with Canada. And in both countries and the other countries that Colleen's talking about, like in Australia and other indigenous areas, same story to take the children. So you cannot imagine there is undescribable to have a whole nation. There's no words for a village with all children gone. There's no sounds in the house, no footsteps, no giggling, no crying, no mama, I'm hungry, none. That's trauma, that's loss, that's harm, that's destruction, and that's genocide. All of that in there is, and it's harsh. It's this a harsh story. And that's why we get so emotional about it because it's hard to carry it and try to put words to it, but we need to. So the film is really, like you said, is an educational resource and it'll never be obsolete because our stories don't grow old. And it, they can be watched for decades and the viewers will still learn from it. And it's also a way to make sure that there's a text about our Indipino community that's accessible. And accessible and created by Indipino people. So this story was written by us. And what I found in my 40 years of being an educator, that the story isn't just for Indigenous people, it's for non-Indigenous people too. We'll all learn from it. And the most important thing in working in education and with schools is one, creating text that's accessible to teachers so they don't have to create their own cur curriculum. Two, creating programs and services that serve students who have the greatest need, but also that serve teachers. I just know for a fact that so many of the people who work in schools, students who go to schools in Kitsap County, they don't know that Bainbridge is the traditional territory of the Suquamish people. And that's just a basic. And we are not the traditional people of Bainbridge Island. Our mothers migrated to Bainbridge Island as migrant workers. And they came from 19 different tribes, most of them Canadian across the border that we didn't create. But what, what that does to us 
is that when we try to start an Indian education program in the Bay Bridge School District, which we did in the 90s, and it still exists today, you think about the lineage and the descendancy. Most of our mothers are not federally recognized tribes because our tribes are in Canada. So the federal government in Washington doesn't recognize us and therefore will not fund the Indian Ed program. Wow. That program wow. is run by head count. Every student who is recognized by a US tribe gets money in the bucket to the school district. And if you only have 10 students, it's a real small program. Anybody who works that program is basically doing volunteer work because the program is so important, but the budget is so small. And that's the problem with developing curriculum and creating programs and services that will educate the entire community about a people who has gone, who have been invisible since the 30s. So you think about it, almost a century we've been invisible is that we're always told it's a lack of funding. We don't know who's going to support that, who's going to support that program, who's going to fund that service. So for the Bainbridge community to step forward and say, we're going to help you develop that text so that it's available to all students, all libraries, all museums, all schools. We're going to do it and we're going to make sure it happens. It's amazing. It is. Well done. <laughs> well done getting that money to make the movie, to make the film. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, that's a big deal. That's a really big deal. They're huge. Yep. So we're, um, we're about, we're at 730 yeah. now. And so I'm thinking we're probably going to wrap up in the next couple minutes. But I wanted to just see if, if anybody had any last thoughts or any, anything else they'd like to share before we, before we go. Are there I'd questions like, from the panelists? Oh, I'd like to make a, a last thought and comment. I mean, we really stuck our necks out to share some of the things that we've had to deal with growing up. And looking at school, looking at the school district and what can we do I encourage everyone to look up Washington state history and start with before it was a state. It became a state November 11th, 1889. There are seven treaties in Washington state. They start out with the Treaty of Medicine Creek, 1854, the Treaty of Point Elliot, the Treaty of Point No Point, the Treaty of Nia Bay, the Treaty of Yakima, the Treaty of Walla Walla, and the Treaty of Quinault. These treaties were brought upon by Governor Isaac Stevenson, mm. and he came through with a boilerplate outline and written into these treaties, it said that for giving up our land and moving on to reservations, our people will be taken care of with health, education, and welfare. You wonder why we're angry. You wonder why we're why do we have Indian people on welfare? Why do we have Indian people beg, borrowing to get funding for education? Why is our health funds run out in the middle of spring and folks that are ill 
need surgery have to wait until October for Indian Health Service to pay for their surgery. So we have to ask ourselves, yes, we had these treaties and we signed away and some of the property that you live on belong to folks from the Salish Sea. It's not paid for. It doesn't have a clear title. The treaties haven't been followed. So history-wise, we need to look at teaching the next generations about why there are some angers by nature. Then maybe we can move forward and create a better place. Sure. Good. Anybody else want to say any last remarks? Are we good? How are you doing, Colleen? <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> Hanging in there. Well, I'll just thank you all so, so, so much. It's truly an honor just to, to meet each of you and to hear your words and your stories, to learn about your families. This has just been an honor for me. And um, I can't wait till the documentary comes out. And hopefully we can talk again. And, you know, um, I'm sure you'll keep in touch and let us know the process and, and how far, how um, the progress of things and, and how we can um, find it and watch it coming up. All right. Thank you so, so much, each of you truly. And um, we'll be in touch soon. Please stay safe. So can I ask you something? Mm -hmm. On my screen, it says Q&A eight. Does that mean there's eight questions or not? Um, let me see here. Oh, thank you. Um, we have we have some comments from from folks. It looks like um, Susan would like to say thank you so much, panelists. I learned so much tonight and have been deeply moved by your stories and the reasons behind your anger. I'm so grateful I attended and heard about the treaties which have been neglected. Thank you, Susan. Disha Patel would like to say to the whole panel, thank you so much for taking the time and energy to show up and share your stories with us tonight. You are all amazing. Lots of lots of thank yous and acknowledgements. Um, there, is a, there is a question, if we have time for one question, that had to do with the relationship between um, your families and the Japanese American families on the island. And just if you could comment to you know, what, what that relationship was, if there was a relationship. I think there, there was a very strong relationship in that when you work the land, you form this natural flow and harmony because the work that you're doing is seasonal. So it's almost like an orchestra. You're always on the same page and you're watching the weather and, and you know when to plant and you know when to harvest and you know how much energy goes into um, having a good, good crop. And because growing up on 20 acres of raspberries, your whole year depends on the harvest for just two weeks of harvest. So I think there was a really deep understanding about um, the work ethic and a commitment to one another to make sure that there was always a bountiful harvest. I think, yeah. uh, oh. I think all of the farmers, I think you're spot on Gina, this, all of the farmers helped one another and I remember my dad going down to help in the Kitamoto fields too, because there was Filipinos working down there and they would just show up to go and help because you need help. Neighbors helping neighbors and to, to bring that crop forward. So, so the, the relationships were significant and, and that's what community is all about, is building relationships. 
Not to mention that during World War II, when the internment camps for the Japanese were were built and our neighbors were sent away to these internment camps, that our fathers worked those fields for the Japanese families while they were in the internment camps. And they continued to uh, work the strawberry fields and the raspberry fields. So at the end of World War II, when the camps were were disbanded, those Japanese families were able to come back to Bainbridge. And in that process, our relationship, some of the land that our fathers were able to buy were made arrangements between the Japanese farmers and our fathers. So um, there was a close knit process and respect um, between the large uh, Japanese farms, uh, Mama Kitamoto, um, Kora, um, Aishida, um, just to name a few that, that helped us and we helped them in their time of need. And we, we moved forward and were able to survive from that. And Bainbridge was the capital for strawberries. We produced the most strawberries in the 60s and 70s that produce that went out all over the world. I mean, Bainbridge Island was the gem. We, we, out, we outgrew Vashon Island. We outgrew the Sumner Valley. Uh, we outgrew the fields in uh, Snohomish. And so history-wise, the hard work that was done between the Filipino and Japanese communities for a short period of time, we were the gem of strawberries for the world. And if people would like to know more, our film that we produced uh, for Islandwood, Island Roots, um, talks about that, the relationship between the Filipino community and the Japanese American community. It's available in the library. Um, we have a couple of more um, comments, which I'll, I'll save for all of you. If you can't see the Q&A panelists, I'll save them for you and forward. Um, there's a question about how to decolonize our spaces, um, specifically to Bainbridge Island, for visual visualization for an Indipino identity on the island. Anyone want to <laughs> tackle that? <laughs> Basically, just, you know, do, how do we decolonize today, present day? What are some tools? Well, I think that question is a good question. I, I see it's, it's my niece who's asking that question also. And it, it is what I was trying to speak to in terms of just looking around the island. You know, what, are, what do we have on the island that speaks of of histories of the Indipino community, Indian community, Filipino community, and and in terms of um, de decolonizing, I mean, there the need to even recognize that there is a story, and that's part of what we're trying to do is is add to the narrative because the narrative that's there now excludes indigenous voice and life. And so it's, uh, Rihanna, it's, a, it's a, a step and the question is good. And it's a question that the community um, can respond to. And the hope is that through the, one way to use the video is to help people wake up in order to speak about the, the lack of um, story or narrative here on the island about Indipinos. And that's, it, it has to be known and, and talked about. And decolonization is a huge process, uh, but it, it can start there and, and, and needs to. Glad you were listening. <laughs> I was, I was reading the next question also too, which has to also do with decolonization. So I was listening to you. <laughs> Oh, um, no, sorry, I was talking to Rayanna. Oh, okay, gotcha. I was like, <laughs> wow, she's calling me out. She saw me reading. Um, 
Um, Mickey Evans says, I believe that we have to decolonize the curriculum and debunk the myths of our school system. I will use this to develop curriculum for teachers. We have to provide space for all stories to be heard. Many black and brown kids do not see themselves in the dominant narrative. I grew up on Bainbridge, have worked with Colleen and Gina, and I'm so excited to use this documentary to change the perspective and dominant narrative. Thank you so much. Indeed. Great. Thank you all so, so, so much. Um, that, that concludes our Q&A. If, uh, if we're good, we'll go ahead and, and sign off. It's about 7.45 and we've taken a lot of your time tonight, panelists. So thanks for staying up with us and giving so much heart and thought and sharing into this evening. It really means a lot. Thank you, Jesse. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Jesse. All. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks Thank for joining you. us, everyone. We'll see you next Thanks, time. Jeff.